Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming and, and being here with us and, and joining us for worship this morning. It is a good day for us to be able to be together and, and celebrate and celebrate Christ's presence. If this is your first time with us, thank you for coming. We have gifts over on the table over here, but before you leave, make sure and stop by and get them. But come back and be with us, and we are glad that you are here. 
45 years ago today, I married that woman standing right over there. <laughs> it has been 45 years of joy for me, and it's been four or five of the best years of Susan's life. And so <laughs> we, it, it's uh, been, been, a, been a good time and a good run. And I'm, I am grateful for all the blessings of my life, particularly that one. Now, before I get emotional, we are here in, in, to celebrate each other's presence and to celebrate the worship of God. Join me in our petition of vision. Lord, it's easy for us to say we believe. It's not so easy to turn our faith into action. Empower us to live our faith that your vision may come true on earth as it is in heaven. Help us to worship you fully today. Worship to infuse our lives that we may live well what we believe. Lord, let your vision live within our hearts as we come here today. You have a clear vision and a mission for all of us. Help us to, to know that you will guide us if we will keep our eyes and our hearts focused on you. May we be focused on you fully today as we come into this place. Help us to worship you well, to gain knowledge as we gather here, and to bring pleasure to your heart. For it is in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and greet one another. People are really nice when they have weddings. Yeah. And the family leaves the cake behind. They give me the. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We have passed the peace. Let's stand together and praise the Lord.
to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. pray together, shall we? Oh God, your joy is our strength and our shield. You are our provider. You are our protector. You're our very present help in times of trouble and difficulty. So as we worship you this morning, we come before you in awe and wonder that you love us the way you do. You know our inner beings better than we even know ourselves. And you know the muddle that we sometimes make of our lives. You know about the relationships we sometimes have failed to maintain. You know about the gifts that you've given us that we sometimes have, have squandered. You know about the bodies we have sometimes abused. You know about the mysteries of your kingdom that we have sometimes ignored, yet you have continued to care for us and to be there when we needed you, and we give you our thanks and our gratitude for your grace and your mercy in our lives. And we come this morning thankful, and we praise you for Jesus Christ, the firstborn of all creation, the one who is before all things, and through him all things have been created on heaven and on earth. And in him all things are held together. And we thank you for his light that came and dwelt among us, for the blessings that flow from his life and his ministry and from his death and resurrection. So remind us again, O oh God, that his light still shines, and we are people of the resurrection, that we were formed for life, not for death, for joy, not for despair. So grant, Lord, that wherever and whenever your church is gathered, as it is this morning, there, that there may be a sense of triumph and eternity, and let your eternal peace reign this morning in our lives, and may it reign in the lives of those we, we know and love who face difficult circumstances that life sometimes brings us. Make us, all of us aware that the, of the everlasting arms that support us each and every day and bestow hope and calmness of spirit in us. Oh God, may your spirit comfort and strengthen us during these days 
Let the joy that is set before us outweigh any sorrow or sadness we may have. May the peace of Christ break out in our hearts. And may the peace of Christ break out in this world that can be so full of violence and corruption and hate and hypocrisy and injustice. So make us, O God, your servants to those who are poor, those who are hungry, those who are broken, those who are disfavored, lonely, oppressed. May our hearts yield to your spirit that we know your will and your ways. And having worshiped you in this place this morning, that we would go forth from here prepared to offer you our spiritual service of worship in the days ahead. This is our prayer, O God. And we offer it in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. things that have changed about me over the last 67 years. There are a few things that are pretty much the same as they have always been. Number one that's not changed very much is that I've always had bad eyesight. I started wearing glasses when I was in the first grade and I was shocked at how clear things were when I suddenly put those glasses on. I guess I thought things were just supposed to be blurry in life. And then I found this amazing invention called eyeglasses and it just cleared up everything. The second thing that hasn't changed much about me is that I was born short and bald and I'm still right where I started. (laughs) 
The third thing that hasn't changed about me very much is that I've always been, even as a kid, a type A personality. I've always been a wee bit extroverted in my life, and, and I thrive on excitement. I guess that's why I always migrated toward emergency services in the different stages of my life. And I guess that's why I'm more interested in change than I am in tradition. And it's not that I don't think tradition is important. I do think it is very important. There are traditions that we need to to hold on to and that we need to cherish. But generally speaking, you don't make progress in life by looking back. You make it by looking forward. One of the fastest runners in history was Jesse Owens. Owens made history not only for his speed, but by outrunning all of the white German runners at the 1939 Olympics. That Olympics was supposed that was held in Berlin was supposed to be the Nazi showcase for white Aryan supremacy. But Jesse or Owens wrecked Adolf Hitler's dream when he went to those Olympics because he won every race that he ran. Jesse was a great athlete but he had one flaw that he had to overcome when he started running when Jesse started racing he he had this habit of looking back over his shoulder to see who might be gaining on him and every time he did that slowed down his momentum and the other runners would pass him and he would lose he said it didn't take me long to realize that it didn't matter what was behind me what mattered was what was in front of me. I had to put my full concentration on being the first to the finish line, and I had to stop worrying about what was back there. I don't know if you've ever tried to, to look back while you were running, but most people fall when they try to do that. It gets your equilibrium off and you lose your balance. But even if you don't fall, looking back is almost guaranteed to cut your speed in half. The moral to this story is that it's almost impossible to win a race if the only direction you are looking is backward. And this is coming from a man who absolutely loves history. I have just finished a book on Abraham Lincoln. And there's no telling how many books on Abraham Lincoln that I've read over the years. I love history history. It was my favorite subject in school. It's amazing at how much you can learn about the future by studying the past, but you can't move forward looking at the past. You can only avoid mistakes by looking at the past, but you can't make progress by doing that. If you want to move forward, you have to have a vision for the future, and then you have to have the courage. You have to have the creativity to try to move that vision forward. You have to turn it into action. We're looking at two short passages of scripture today. The first one is the one that most scholars call Jesus's vision statement. The second one is what most scholars call Jesus's mission statement. It's hard to miss that the second one is a mission statement. I think the reason that Jesus gave us these two passages of Scripture is because Jesus wanted us to remember that both of these, a vision and a mission, are vital if you want to have a positive future. Our first passage is John 13, 34 through 35. <clears throat> now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love one another. Just as I've loved you, love one another. By this, all people will know you are my disciples if you love one another. That's a very short passage of scripture, but it drives home a very important point. Faith isn't faith if it doesn't become action. And true faith becomes action in the form of God's love. It's easy to <clears throat> overlook, excuse me, <clears throat> what Jesus is saying in this passage, because in the English language, we only have one word for love. In the Greek language, they had four words for love, and, <clears throat> and you knew exactly what they were trying to talk about by whatever form of love that they were using in their scriptures or, or just in their day-to-day -day conversations. We don't have that luxury, but... By having that luxury, we know exactly what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus was using the word agape, which we've talked about many times. Agape was love in action. <clears throat> God's love isn't just a feeling. It isn't just an emotion. It's an action that goes beyond our feelings. 
Jesus' crucifixion was an act of blessing that went beyond feelings. There wasn't anything about the crucifixion that felt good to Jesus. And I promise you that he was not having warm, fuzzy feelings about the people who had screamed for him to be crucified, about the people who had beaten him almost to death and then drove nails into his hands. Jesus put his love into action to show the world how far God's love would go to try to save us from ourselves. And when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they are doing. He wasn't offering a blessing because he felt good. He offered it because it was the right thing to do. It was the caring thing to do. It was the loving thing to do. Every part of the crucifixion is a great example of love in action. It was Jesus putting feet to his faith. It was Jesus putting the needs of the world ahead of his own needs. James 2, 17 and 26, these verses say, In the same way, faith by itself is not enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. What James is trying to make the church understand there is you can't warm the pew on Sunday and and do nothing on Monday and call it faith. Because true faith isn't just something you believe, it's something that you do. Jesus had a vision. And that vision was what his church would be, that he wanted it to be a place that that would be God's love in action in the world. He wanted and wanted his people to to put their hearts, their, their minds, their voices, their hands, their feet. He wanted them to put their entire lives to work for God's love because faith in the Bible is always a verb. It's the process of bringing God's love to life in the world. Jesus had a vision. He wanted the church to bring God's sacrificial life to, 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 to life in the world, sacrificial love to life in the world. And he wanted the church to be making new disciples because he wanted the people to be out there doing what they could to bring transformation to the world. And the only way that you could do that, the only way that could happen was for people to fall in love with God and then follow the teachings that Jesus had given them, follow the examples that Jesus had given them. Or to say it a different way, Jesus' vision had to become the church's mission. Matthew 29, 19 and 20. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Jesus is vision was that his people would become the embodiment of God's love in the world. And their mission was to spread that message throughout the world. It was to make new disciples for Jesus everywhere that they went and then to teach those disciples how to obey what he had taught his disciples to follow in Jesus's footsteps going into the world. Probably five years ago or so, I wrote a devotional that got more response than most of my devotional. Devotionals do. In fact, it's one of the few devotionals that I've ever written that actually spurred this online conversation. And it, it was a good discussion of what it actually meant. The devotional was based on Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, do your work diligently as if you were working for the Lord and not for people. The line that I wrote in that devotional that spurred so much discussion was a line that I didn't even think much about when I actually wrote it. It said, Jesus was doing God's work when he was a carpenter in Nazareth and when he was a preacher in Israel. For some reason, that one line struck a chord with people. I I don't exactly know why. I think the reason that it did is because it's easy for us to think that Jesus was doing God's work when he was when he was preaching and teaching and healing and feeding the hungry. But it's not as easy for us to think that Jesus was doing God's work when he was building chairs and tables for people's homes. But He was. Jesus didn't just suddenly wake up one morning and decide, oh, it's time for me to go serve God now. 
He was a believer all of his life and whatever he was doing, he was trying to preach the gospel with his life and with his words. Jesus was a man of God and he was doing God's work when he was working in that carpenter shop, supporting his family after his daddy had passed away. Why is that important? It's important because if we are followers of Jesus, everything we do has to become God's mission for our lives. There, there shouldn't be our secular life and then our spiritual life. There shouldn't be a division between how we live our lives. Every moment of our lives need to be part of God's mission. Jesus doesn't have a vision for us becoming God's love in action just when we're sitting here in our church. He wants us to be his agape love wherever we are, whenever we are traveling through this world. God was a godly, car Jesus was a godly carpenter. He was also a godly preacher. I have a friend who's a contractor. If you ever need a good contractor, let me know. I'll give you his name. He is outstanding. I don't think I've ever met anybody who worked as hard to try to make his profession a mission. It's just something that comes naturally for him. When Terry does work for a church in the region, he always gives a tithe of their fees back to that church. And he donates an amazing amount of time doing work for people who can't afford to hire his services. His line is, there was a time when I was anything in the world but a Christian, but Jesus lifted me up and he turned my life around and he blessed my life when I didn't deserve it. So I try to be a blessing and a witness for Jesus. And my work is something that gives me an inroad to people so I can tell them my story. And so it can help them. Almost anything good can become a mission of Jesus if we'll make our focus God's love. If we'll make our focus turning agape into life itself. Acts 1, 8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus wasn't just calling his disciples to, to go to outer Mongolia and do missions in foreign lands. Jesus was calling his disciples to embody the love of God wherever they were. If you live in Jerusalem, that's your mission field. If you live in, 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 in Christiansburg, that's your mission field. If, if you live in, in anywhere you happen to be, that's your mission field. If you're in Judea, if you're in Samaria... That's your mission field. If you're a student at UVA, we'll pray for you, but that's your mission field. <laughs> Wherever you are, that's where God has placed you. That's where God has planted you. And, and the church's job is to make disciples for Jesus and then to create the training ground to, to provide the avenues for, for making people into the kind of missionaries that God would have us be. Some people disagree with me on what I'm about to say, but this is still how I feel. Jesus has planted this church in Blacksburg and he's he's <coughs> planted us in a place where we have an amazing ability to touch lives. This is our Jerusalem. But one of the best things about being in this town is that we can have a global influence right where we are. We had a church member several years ago who was <coughs> from Brazil. The church literally had so much influence on her life that it, it changed the way that she saw Jesus Christ. And so when she went back to Brazil, she tried to find a church like ours. She wasn't able to find exactly what she was hoping for. So she started inviting people to come to her house to have a Bible study. And then she invited people who understood English to come and watch our worship service on Sunday morning and then to sit there and discuss what they had experienced. We've baptized a number of people that, that have come through our Chinese Bible study and then they've gone home to, to be witnesses for Jesus. Wai Lu, Hing Har Lo, Chao Shang, they've all been instrumental in expanding our church's witness in the China. <coughs> we have a witness that's being planted in England right now. We, we had a number of people come here who've become Christians and they've gone back to different African nations and they've planted a witness there. 
All of this doesn't even count. The college students that have passed through our church who have become believers and several of those are ministers or pastors right here in Virginia now. God has planted us in a truly strategic location. He has a vision for all that we can do and he has a mission that he wants us to accomplish. This is a town where we can have a global outreach provided that we'll take our planting seriously. God's vision is for us to fall in love with God and then to love one another the way Jesus has loved us. And he wants us to go then and make disciples in Jesus' name. And I know that can feel overwhelming to all of us. It can feel like a burden sometimes to all of us. I know just inviting your neighbor to church can feel uncomfortable and it can feel daunting. And take my word for it, I know exactly how it feels to get rejected when you are trying to do something good. But God has planted this church in a place where we can make a difference in our town, in our region, and across the globe. And our job is to try to take that planting seriously. Really, you're just getting planted. Like imagine from the perspective of the seed, you're just getting dirt thrown in your face. But from the perspective of the gardener, you're getting the soil you need to grow. And so sometimes it feels like you're getting buried when actually you're getting planted by God for your calling. Lord, you have a planting place for all of us. You have planted a seed of love, a seed of grace, a, a seed of your spirit in our souls that only begins to blossom when we have experienced your love. It's a little hard for us to become your mission in the world, for us to bring your vision to life if, if we don't have the faith in our souls to start with. Help us, O oh Lord, to come to you and to ask you to be part of our existence, to ask you to come into our lives and bring your, your grace to life in our souls. Help us to want to become your action in the world. Help us to love you as you have loved us. And then help us to want to share that love in the way we live and in the words we say. We have a church that has been planted here for 170 years. Help us to be the next productive chapter of that story, Lord. Help us to want to grow into your dream. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. Stand and let's sing our closing hymn together. <laughs> I have decided to follow I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me.
God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all of the blessings of this day. We thank you for the hope that you bring to the world, and we pray, oh God, to be part of that hope. Let your spirit be with us as we leave this place today. Help us to know you well, to want to love you fully, to try to love the world as you have loved us, and to take seriously our planting. Make your dreams come true for us today, O Lord, and make us determined to be part of that. And now may the Lord bless and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you peace this day and every day, now and forevermore. Amen.